impacted Juneau being one and Chippewa County uh, that are in my congressional district being the other one. And we've been monitoring that very closely, trying to coordinate between the various agencies at the federal, state, and local level, and working with the, uh, the farmers themselves, trying to contain and eradicate the spread of the virus uh, right now so it doesn't spin out of control. Uh, and, it's, and it's detected its whole flock uh, extermination is what we've got going. And I've been working with uh, the Agriculture Secretary, Tom Vilsack, on some indemnity funds for our farmers that are impacted. This is a tough thing to insure. And so if they have to destroy their flock, they're on their own. Uh, but also some additional funding for the uh, uh, vaccine development. And there's a lot of research and a lot of work being put into uh, vaccine development. It's a little tricky because this virus does mutate quite quickly. So it's kind of hard for science to stay out ahead of it. But uh, we also know that uh, um, this is being spread by migratory birds. And so we're towards the tail end of the spring migration. And also, as John just pointed out to me a minute ago, the virus doesn't do very well in warmer weather. So we have that going for us, kind of nature uh, working to our advantage. But Minnesota, Iowa's been racked pretty hard, the state of emergencies there. There's been no known human transmission. I want to make that uh, perfectly clear. But nevertheless, it's something given uh, the agricultural interests that we have here that we have to pay close attention to. Another issue is rail safety. We've got a ton of Bakken oil now that's being transported through Wisconsin, heading to the east uh, coast, and uh, multiple derailments, five since February alone. And the one this week up in North Dakota being the most recent. We had one down by Galena, Illinois, just a couple weeks back, just across the border from us. And so we've been focused on what we can do to enhance the safety and transporting this very volatile and highly toxic uh, product, the Bakken oil. Um, uh, the Service Transportation Board and the Railroad Administration just came out with safety rules this week. We're reviewing that, we're working with them. There are areas where they have taken a step in the right direction. Other areas I'd like to see some improvement on. And so we're gonna monitor that uh, very closely. Of course, we've got a rail line right through here in Boston uh, itself. Uh, so serious issue. And I think there are additional steps we can take to minimize the derailments, but also to coordinate the response to them uh, if they occur. So we've been reaching out to a lot of our local first responders and make sure that they're getting the training and the equipment that they need uh, to deal with that. And uh, uh, finally, here at the local level too, we just had a town hall meeting at Toma VA Medical Center. Uh, the Undersecretary for Health, Dr. Clancy, was in and she had a town hall first with the staff at Toma VA this morning and then a community-wide uh, town hall uh, this afternoon that I attended with her to get feedback from the community, from veterans, from their families uh, as far as what they know and what they're seeing. And that's very, very helpful to kind of fill out the facts and the narrative that we need to make uh, the changes and adjustments so our veterans are getting the care and the treatment that they earned and they deserve. We're trying to keep the focus on the veterans and the quality of care and what we can do working together <clears throat> to assure that. And there's still some work to be done. Uh, this is a, uh, um, very much a fact-gathering type of mission. And we had a nice field hearing there about a month ago with the VA committee that came to Toma and took testimony and quite frankly, very compelling testimony from some family members who lost their veterans who were receiving treatment uh, at Toma. So in response to the facts that I have been able to gather thus far, I've introduced a couple of bills, uh, bipartisan bills, working closely with the rest of the Wisconsin delegation. One calls for the creation of a pain management board, so there's a more collaborative team approach to pain management practices with our veterans, and also a place where veterans and family members can have a voice in proper treatment protocol. Because it's, most of the time it's the family members who know if it's working or not, and if adjustments have to be made or a different approach needs to take place. And this pain management board would create that opportunity so it would be more inclusive uh, and uh, better, I think, in the outcome. But I also think this is not just unique to Toma. I think we've got a pain management problem uh, throughout the VA system and, quite frankly, throughout the healthcare system. And we just have not done a very good job with quality measurements, metrics, protocols of care when it comes to that. So, in a way, this is an opportunity to hopefully establish a model that we can take throughout the entire healthcare system to improve proper pain management uh, practices out there. Um, but there's still more work to be done, and we're tracking it and involved in it very, very closely. Uh, more generally, uh, I've been very much focused on student indebtedness issue. Our kids are having to take out bigger loans to go to school. 
leaving them with a large debt to manage some throughout most of their lives, just as they're trying to get a job or start a family or maybe purchase their first car or home or whatever. And there are, I think, some steps we can take to do a better job of making sure education is more affordable to all of our students without driving them deeper and deeper in debt. And so I introduced legislation called the Higher Education Affordability Bill that I've been working with my colleagues on, see if we can get it included in the Higher Education Bill that's coming up uh, later this year. Um, and then also on the healthcare front, trying to work with our healthcare providers to develop models of care that we know work well, that are more integrated, coordinated, patient-centered, that get better results at a better price. And then changing the way we pay for healthcare. So it's based on the outcome and the quality of care that's given and not the quantity of things that are done to us. And these volume-based payments, where they get paid regardless of results for tests, procedures, things, that's really been bankrupting us as a nation and driving up health care costs uh, unnecessarily. So we're part at work trying to implement those changes. Uh, finally, uh, there will be, and you'll hear more discussion on this in coming weeks, but a trade agenda right now that I think is important for our nation. Uh, the president needs uh, trade authority so we can go out and negotiate with other countries what the rules and standards of trade will be. Uh, and working with Congress have the negotiating objectives of what we'd like to see in these agreements that can help elevate standards up to where we are already and level the playing field you know, for our workers and our farmers and our businesses so they can successfully compete in these fast-growing markets and regions. You know, Wisconsin, for instance, we're very proud of agriculture tradition and we're, the, we're, the, we're number two in the nation when it comes to dairy exports. And dairy exports have been going up in recent years too. And these are very promising markets that we're trying to tear down uh, trade barriers to our goods and our products and, and our dairy products especially so we have greater access uh, to these markets. And that comes uh, with good paying jobs too. So I think moving forward on a trade agenda where we're at the table establishing the rules of trade makes sense to me. Otherwise, we could find ourselves trying to trade with these other nations with no rules at all, which means a race to the bottom. It's going to be hard for us to compete. Or a trading system dominated by China's rules. And China would love nothing better than to get in there and establish the rules on their terms and having us try to compete on their terms rather than the standards that we're trying to establish. And some of those standards are core labor standards, environmental standards, human rights standards, things that we already have in this country. Uh, such as a prohibition against the exploitation of child labor or slave labor, the ability to collectively bargain, the establishment of minimum wage laws, even in a country like Vietnam or Malaysia. And they are agreeing to this stuff for the first time. Um, and so I, we're going to have more discussion about this and then plenty of time for everyone to look at a trade agreement that is finally negotiated. In fact, it has to be published for everyone to see at least 60 days before the president signs it. So we have a chance to look at it and see if it makes sense for Wisconsin, makes sense for this area, before Congress is asked to uh, support it or oppose it on, on a vote. So that's what's going on. I know we've had some others uh, raising some questions in previous listening sessions about what this Trade Promotion Authority is and uh, what these trade agreements are all about. And I'd be happy to get into that in more detail. Uh, with anyone here. So thank you all for coming and we're going to uh, start going here.